treatment is stopped. And one month later, the M spike reappears, and now it's 0.3 gram per deciliter of IgG kappa. So I want to particularly focus on USNIS CR, and the protein went up to 0.3, and this happened <coughs> one month after the patient stopped bortezomib and lenalidomide. How would you characterize this patient? Was only len refractory, only bortezomib refractory, dual refractory or refractory to neither? How many people for one? For two, all right, need to get everybody <laughs> awake here. Um, refractory to both uh, bortezomib and len, all right? And then refractory to neither, okay. There was a few people who said uh, uh, three. Let me just go back to the previous slide. You know, sometimes it can be very confusing, and then you try to put patients on clinical trials, trying to decide what the patients are refractory to. So the current definition for refractoriness to a drug is defined as either relapsing on therapy or relapsing within six uh, within 60 days of stopping treatment. So that's one confusing thing. And the second confusing part is also how you define progression. So has this patient actually progressed? Not yet. By definition, you have to have at least a 0.5 gram per deciliter improvement in, or increase in the M spike before you actually can call this patient progression. So from a patient who is in CR, you have to have a minimum of 0.5 increase. Now let's just assume that this patient actually did have a 0.5. Would that, that would make this patient refractory <coughs> to both bortezomib and lenalidomide. So bortezomib, if they progress within 60 days of start stopping the treatment, that patient is considered refractory. This patient previously progressed while on len maintenance, so the patient would be considered len refractory as well. But for in this particular setting, this is just lenalidomide refractory only. All right, so what, where do we find our patients at first relapse today in the clinic? <coughs> they could have reached there through three different pathways. One, they could have been transplant ineligible and they may have gotten RD with or without a break and they get to the first relapse. Patients who are transplant eligible would get injection therapy with BRD or BCD stem cell transplant, len or bortezomib maintenance, and they reach first relapse. Or they may have deferred a transplant and gone on VRD injection and then continued on len maintenance. But the common theme for the first relapse is most of the patients in our clinic today is likely to be lenalidomide refractory at the time of their first relapse. And some of them may be refractory to bortezomib as well. So if you look at the randomized trials that inform us as to what to do with these patients who are len refractory, we have three phase three trials and one randomized phase two trial they have, that have looked at therapies that does not include lenalidomide as a standard uh, arm. So the end of our trial looked at carfilzomib dex versus bortezomib dex, demonstrating that there's an overall survival improvement and a PFS improvement. The Panorama trial added the HTAC inhibitor panabinostat to bortezomib dexamethasone, showing that there's a PFS improvement of roughly about three to four months, but no improvement in the overall survival. The CASTER trial, that was a dretumumab bortezomib dexamethasone versus bortezomib dexamethasone, also showed an improvement in BFS. We don't have mature data to look at the overall survival. And similarly, the ilotuzumab bortezomib dex versus bortezomib dex showed an improvement in the BFS. It's a randomized phase two trial. But we do have set, definitely very, several options for somebody who is refractory to lenalidomide going on, uh, getting into the first relapse. So there were several um, uh, abstracts that were presented at ASCO which kind of builds upon this theme. What do we do with patients who are lent refractory at the time of the first relapse? Now, these patients in this particular trial, these are patients with one to three prior lines of therapy who have had at least two cycles of lenalidomide before and have relapsed disease. And they were randomized to either bortezomib dexamethasone standard dose and schedule with or without pomalidomide added to it, and patients continued until disease progression. They were able to show that adding pomalidomide, sorry, adding uh, pomalidomide to the bortezomib dexamethasone, for some reason this project well, um, these are the patients who are all patients. You can see that patients had significant improvement in the overall response rate and VGPR rate by adding pomalidomide to bortezomib dexamethasone. Now, if you just looked at the patients who are len, um, not refractory to lenalidomide, we can see that the response rate was a little bit higher uh, compared to the patients, uh, all comers. Now, this did translate to a better progression-free survival as well. 
um, and you can see that there's approximately about a four month improvement in the median PFS by adding pomalidomide to bortezomib dexamethasone. So clearly this is one another option for patients who are refractory to lenalidomide as this subgroup analysis again shows. If you look at the patients who are refractory to lenalidomide, you still get about a four month improvement in the median PFS by adding uh, pomalidomide to the bortezomib dexamethasone. It's interesting, this data is very consistent, what we have seen across the board. In somebody who is refractory to lenalidomide, pomalidomide adds about four to five months improvement in PFS, whether you use it in combination or use it as a single agent. So what about the lenalidomide non-refractory patients? Here you see a substantial improvement, about 11 month improvement in the progression-free survival when you use a combination of pomalidomide, bortezomib, dexamethasone. Now, what about um, patients um, who, you know, this is again the data from the end of our trial demonstrating that patients who um, got the higher dose of carfilzomib dexamethasone. So this is basically a randomized trial looking at a higher dose carfilzomib, 56 milligram per meter square, versus the standard schedule of bortezomib and standard dosing schedule, showing that there was actually a significantly improved PFS and a significantly improved overall survival when you use carfilzomib dexamethasone combination. And the problem with the carfilzomib in this particular trial is that you, it's given twice weekly. So patients have to come in twice a week, three weeks in a row, and then one week off. So there has been a lot of um, focus on trying to see if we can give carfilzomib just once a week instead of giving it twice a week. So the ARROW study that was presented at ASCO randomized patients again um, due to three prior lines of therapy. And these patients were again stratified by ISO stage, refractory resistance to bortezomib, and age. Randomized to once weekly carfilzomib given at 70 milligram per meter square. And also in comparison to the standard dosing of carfilzomib at 27 milligram per meter square given days one, you know, twice weekly for three weeks on, one week off. They were able to show that the once with the once weekly regimen. The carfilzomib, uh, again given at 70 milligram per meter square, was associated with a significantly higher overall response rate and also deeper response in terms of VGPR. And it also translated to significantly improved progression free survival with the once uh, weekly carfilzomib versus the lower dose twice weekly carfilzomib. So I think this certainly gives the opportunity to use the carfilzomib in a much more convenient fashion in, once, in a once weekly um, schedule. Now, there are a couple of caveats with this. Obviously, they have been um, you know, as, it's a cardiac risk associated with the higher dose of carfilzomib, and this is only in as a single agent, and we don't have sufficient data to use carfilzomib at 70 milligram per meter square once weekly in combination with, let's say, even a moderate drugs. There are some smaller phase two studies, but no larger phase three trials. So, one thing you have to be careful about, especially in the older patients, is the risk of um, hypertension. Um, as well as cardiova other cardiovascular toxicity. Now, if you look at the subgroup analysis, you can see that all the patients benefited by the higher dose of, um, once weekly of Carfilzomib. So, irrespective of age, performance status, the ISO stage, renal function, or the type of therapies they had previously uh, received. Now, we all briefly talked about the Castor trial. So, this is again an option for patients who are refractory to lenalidomide at the time of first relapse using a combination of Dretumumab, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. So the Castor trial had shown that there was a significantly improved progression-free survival by adding the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody dretumumab to bortezomib, dexamethasone. So the next step was to try and see, can we actually improve upon this regimen by switching out the bortezomib to something like carfilzomib? Because it's possible many of these patients have been exposed to bortezomib um, during the time of injection therapy and some may even be, re be refractory at the time of first relapse. So this is the study that is, um, again, MMY 1001. It's a study with multiple arms looking at a variety of different retinomab combinations. So this trial is, a, again, is a single arm study, 75, um, 85 patients who received retinomab in combination with the uh, once weekly carfilzomib. So first cycle 20, subsequent cycles are 70 milligram per meter square, standard doses of dexamethasone. And Again, you can see that the overall response rate was almost 84% in this group of patients. And even if you look at the patients who are length refractory, you still get about 80% of these patients um, having an overall response, a partial response of better to this three drug combination. 
And you can see that almost two thirds of these patients actually got a very good partial response or better. So this three drug regimen can clearly um, have significant efficacy in the lent refractory patient population. And you can also see that some of these patients who are in CR are also um, MRD negative, uh, albeit very small numbers in this particular analysis. Now, if you look at the uh, progression free survival, the median, we have increased the median progression free survival in many of these groups, but the 12 month PFS uh, was again quite uh, decent, um, especially in the patients who are lent refractory, but in the dual refractory patient population, nearly half of these patients were still um, progression free at the end of one year. So, certainly an effective regimen, and this is currently being studied in phase three trials as well. So let me um, ask one other question here. Um, what is the most common abnormality seen on fish in multiple myeloma? How many people for 1114? Right? How many for 414? Right? 614 acres. Trisomies of odd numbered chromosomes. All right. And deletion 17B. The correct answer is uh, trisomies. So that's seen in about 45% of patients with uh, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. 11-14 is seen in about, 50, uh, about 15 to 20% of the patients. 4-14 is about 15, 6-14 is about 2%, and 17-P deletion of diagnosis is about 7%. Um, the reason I wanted to bring up the, the abnormality is because I think that's where the disease is moving forward, is trying to develop therapies that's targeted towards specific abnormalities. And I think we are starting to see the, um, you know, probably the, one of the 